Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. From Chapter 7 onward, in Notes from the Underground, Fyodor Dostoevsky is going to spell out for us something that he thinks that most philosophers, and we might even expand this to all of our life coaches and psychologists and social reformers and pick whoever you like, there's a vital aspect of human existence and value that has been left out. And he, he calls this the most advantageous advantage because he's placing this within a framework within which people have been talking about interests and advantages, and it, and it explodes the framework, as he says. It undoes it. It, it tears it apart. Now, I, I want to say something right from the start. Dostoevsky here may seem to be generalizing about human beings across the board and saying that we're all driven by this one advantage. He's not actually saying that. He is saying that this is a, a, an integral possibility of human existence that we can never truly rule out, but it's not one that every human being necessarily is realizing, nor do they have to, because it's up to them if they want to. It's up to them if they want to make it central in their table of values or hierarchy of, of needs or whatever, whatever other construct we're going to use to make sense of this. He is saying that this is something that the moral philosopher or psychologist or whoever you're going to be who wants to understand human nature had better take account of because it's going to be there and it's going to be happening over and over and over again and exercising its influence. So he's counterposing this to all of these other people who want to have a sort of rational, empirically based. These days we would, you know, talk about studies and, you know, constructs and all of these sorts of things ranging from, you know, uh, positive psychology on one end all the way over through all sorts of, you know, neuroscience and, and, uh, you know, social theory. But they all basically come down to the same fundamental idea that we could have a, a rational and also empirical or evidence-based system that would harmonize and integrate and educate people about and over that process change their interests or recognition of interests and their advantages. So, you know, we could get people to see, for example, that holding on to their, their superstitions or their deeply held beliefs might actually be counterproductive for them. If what they really want is X, and, you know, why is interfering with it, then maybe why needs to go, even though they're very invested in why. And, you know, the, the story of human progress, both intellectually and socially, and in terms of the individual human person, could be understood as a story about how, by application of reason, by, you know, integrating other things, our faculties of observation, we're able to fix ourselves, make ourselves less screwed up. And, you know, not just as individuals, but in, in relation to each other as well. So Dostoevsky says that, um, you know, what are the sort of things that they, they, they talk about in this improvement of human beings in society? Uh, advantages like, um, he says, happiness, prosperity, freedom, Security. These are, you know, we could say big, big picture buzzwords, but they are the things that moral theories and self-help and psychology and all the, you know, uh, social theory really do talk about a lot. Why? Because those are important to us. We do, in fact, desire happiness. 
We don't just desire happiness. There's other things. We do desire prosperity, however we, we picture that to ourselves. We do desire freedom. We do desire security. And it is possible to get people to recognize that their picture of prosperity might in fact be killing their neighbor or destroying the oceans or you know doing a whole bunch of other things that are actually counterproductive. And then they can say, oh, I, I have to change that. You know, I'll stop eating this kind of fish and eat this kind of fish instead. Or we'll have regulations about this. Or we'll get rid of regulations. Or we'll do this or do that, right? That, that's certainly possible. And if it's going to be done, why shouldn't it be evidence-based? Why shouldn't it be rational? Why shouldn't it be open to public discussion about it so we arrive at the best way of doing it? Now, all of this assumes that we can draw up something like a table or he he talks about it as you know systems or timetables or you know statistical averages and scientific formulas and all, all sorts of things along those lines and he says maybe we can come up with a nice arrangement an ordering of the values or interests or advantages for human beings well there's a problem according to dostoevsky there's at least one advantage that has been left out of the picture. Why? Well, it's not very tractable to the sciences. It's not very savory for moral philosophy or, or social theory. As a matter of fact, it, it seems a little selfish. It seems a little self-indulgent. But it is to our advantage, he says. It is something that we really do, in fact, desire. Not only do we desire it, but it's even something that is, in some respect, good for us, but good for us in a way different than all these other things. And Dostoevsky calls this the most advantageous advantage. And he, he says that what's remarkable is that all of your statisticians, sages, and humanitarians when listing human advantages, insist on leaving out one of them. They never even allow for it, thus invalidating all their calculations. One would think it would be easy just to add it to the list, but that's where the trouble lies. It doesn't fit into any scale or chart. So you've got two options. Exclude it. In which case, what you're doing is, as he's going to call it a little bit later, in one of the, the chapters to come, it becomes a sterile, essentially abstract academic exercise that doesn't bear any real uh, connection to, to lived reality, that doesn't have any purchase on it, that's not going to effectively get us to change. Or you take it into account and then it's going to explode your rational system. It's going to make a mess out of it. And he brings up his friend, right, uh, the composite type who understands what's good, what's beautiful, what's true, what's just, uh, tells everybody that he's going to do it and they ought to follow it and then does the opposite and starts talking the opposite 15 minutes later. And he says, maybe there is something that every man values above the highest individual advantage or so as not to be illogical, there may exist a human advantage that is the most advantageous which is also more important than the others and for the sake of which a person, if need be, will go against reason, honor, security, and prosperity, in short, against all the beautiful and useful things, just to attain it, the most advantageous advantage of the lot, the one that is dearest to him. And his interlocutor says, oh, well, you're admitting it's an advantage. Yes, it is an advantage, but it's not one that fits into your chart or scale or system. He says... The remarkable thing is that it makes a shamble of all the classifications and tables drawn up by humanitarians for the happiness of mankind. It crowds them out, as it were. And then that's where he says, well, these are all just kind of sterile exercises in logic. So how does he characterize this advantage? He has a number of different formulas, each of which is worth looking at so that we can get a full picture of what he has in mind. He says that, um, when we go against the system, as it were, it says the explanation is so simple, there hardly needs to be any need for it. A person always and everywhere prefers to act in the way they feel like acting 
and not in the way that their reason and interests tell them. For it is very possible for a person to feel like acting against their interests, and in some instances, I may say that he positively wants to act that way. But that's my personal opinion. And then he gives you the formula. One's own free, unrestrained choice, one's own whim, we're going to come back to that word in a bit, be it the wildest, one's own fancy, sometimes worked up to a frenzy. That is the most advantageous advantage that cannot be fitted into any table or scale and causes every system and every theory to crumble into dust on contact. Where do these sage pick up the notion man must have something they feel is a normal and virtuous set of wishes? All man really needs is independent will at all costs and whatever the consequences. We want to will what we want to will and not to have to cram it into some sort of system. And you can think of all the different cases where this, this applies. Everything from, oh, I, I, don't wanna, I know that the following my diet is good for me and I should exercise tonight, but I, I don't feel like it. I want to do something else instead. I'm going to go out and have a couple beers and then come home and watch some streaming video. And you say, well, don't you realize you're setting yourself behind doing that? Yeah, I know, but I want to do it. And this is my life. I'm going to do it. You know, uh, people do all sorts of crazy, apparently stupid things on the basis of whim. When we use that term whim, we're talking about something that doesn't really have a grounding. Another word for this that, uh, you know, people have used that's much more morally laden is, is perversity. Uh, and you might actually check out Edgar Allan Poe's essay, The Imp of the Perverse, which is talking about this same sort of phenomenon, except, of course, in a sort of gruesome horror context less of a day-to-day -day thing. But he talks about how we can know what we ought to do and we can say, oh, I'm, I'm going to do something different because I want to do something different because it's, it's me. I get to decide. So he goes on another uh, passage. This is in chapter 8. He says that um, what a person wants to do um, and why they go against what, what reason dictates is to establish his right to wish for the most idiotic things and not to be obliged to have only sensible wishes. Reason would like us to have only sensible, intelligible, publicly accessible, however you want to frame it, right? healthy wishes. But we have other wishes and, and we have to decide, well, do I uproot all of those for myself and become what? the picture of somebody else or, or do I accept myself in, you know, the fact that I want to do this. I want to sleep in on, on Sunday. I want to stay up too late. I want to, you know, read the book later. Uh, I want to send the thank you note uh, on my own time or perhaps not at all. Right. He says that man is actually the most ungrateful creature at one point. Now, why, why do we want that? And he says, well, he says it, it, it may be more advantageous to us than all the other advantages, even when it most obviously harms us and goes against all the sensible conclusions of our reason about our interest, because whatever else it leaves us our most important, most treasured possession our individuality. Whim and individuality are connected together. Notice he doesn't say good individuality. He doesn't say beautiful individuality. It might be, you know, I'm, I'm this guy and oh, this is what I've got. You know, here's what I have to offer. And it's not great, but it is me. And I get to decide for, for me what I'm going to keep. So that, that's another way. He goes on uh, further in uh, chapter 8, and he talks about um, how harmful this can be for us at times. He says, what can we expect from human beings, considering they're such strange creatures, right? They'll risk their cake for the sake of the most glaring stupidity, for the most economically unsound nonsense, just to inject into all the soundness and sense surrounding him some of their own disastrous, lethal fancies. What he wants to, to preserve is precisely his noxious fantasies and vulgar trivialities. 
if only to assure himself that human beings are still human beings, as if that was so important. He says, man is somehow averse to the idea of being unable to desire unless this desire happens to figure on his timetable at that moment. We want to be able to hold on to the things that hold us back from, from this other perspective. We want to be able to screw things up. I heard a very interesting statement just the other day about somebody who went quite a ways into debt and brought his, his wife as well into debt as they were to discover later on. And um, the person who was recalling this to me said, well, actually it makes quite a bit of sense because I remember him saying at one time, here's my idea. If somebody's dumb enough to sell it to me, well then hell, I'll buy it. And now think about how, how stupid that is, how irrational that is. You can't regulate a life that way, can you? Well, yes, you can. It's just going to be a bit of a ruin of a life. But nobody said that a life actually has to be rational, you know, evidence-based, well-arranged or anything like that. And people will choose sometimes just so that they can choose for that to be the case. Uh, in chapter... Uh, nine, he, or in chapter 10, rather, um, no, it is chapter nine. He, he brings this to sort of a close by saying, I'm not advocating suffering any more than well-being. Human beings can choose suffering. They can choose well-being. He says, what I'm for is whim. And I want the right to use it whenever I want to. And he says, I know, for example, suffering is inadmissible in utopian light state, in, in light stage plays in the utopian crystal palace. It would be inconceivable, but I don't want the crystal palace. I don't want a crystal palace that I can't stick my tongue out at. Or if we want to use the equivalent idiom today to give the finger to, I want the right to be able to decide for myself, even if what I'm deciding for is actually quite stupid and irrational and goes against the evidence because that is valuable to me. That is the most advantageous advantage. And you can see how once you admit this into the picture, it undoes any sort of chart or timetable that you put together. They're all rather contingent. They don't represent a rational necessity that we all have to follow. If we do happen to follow them, that's actually luck or our desires coming together or reason managing to thread the needle of convincing people to actually behave rationally a good portion of the time. So this is what uh, Dostoevsky thinks everybody who's going to talk about human beings either has to take into account or they're engaging in a kind of abstract logic exercise. 